Well, good afternoon. Uh, we're going we're to get started here. I'm, I'm Don Scavia. I'm the uh, director of the Graham Sustainability Institute here on campus and faculty positions in civil environmental engineering and in the School of Natural Resources and Environment. Um, we've got five speakers um, in, in this session in 75 minutes, so we're going to be plowing through very quickly. Um, the focus here is on uh, water footprinting and other analytics to help us uh, make better decision and decisions um, in, in the water space. Um, and the way we structured this is uh, Wendy Larson is going to give us the first presentation to sort of help set the stage and, and give us the broad perspective on the issue. Um, and then the four speakers following her are going to do short talks to give a different perspectives on, on the overall topic. Um, and then we'll have them all come up um, here in the panel uh, table to, uh, to field questions as we, as we go forward. Um, I'm also, and I hope the speakers don't mind, uh, but to conserve time, I'm not going to use these very long paragraphs describing their wonderful uh, attributes. I'll just uh, announce them quickly as they come, out, come up. Uh, so coming first is Wendy Larson. Uh, Wendy is a senior scientist at Limnotech Incorporated, uh, one of our consulting firms here in town and elsewhere. We work very closely with them. Uh, her expertise and her area of focus has been on water, water footprinting and analytics associated with that for helping people make decisions. So Wendy, please come up first. Thank you, Don. Okay, well, there are four speakers, four other speakers in this session, and my intent here is to set the context for their presentations by first providing a bit of an overview of, of global water issues. I know that you're, um, many of you here are, are very familiar with those, but to get us all kind of on the same page, and then provide a, a summary, an overview of the many, many water stewardship initiatives that are in play right now can be very confusing. Um, water footprinting is one of them. That term is used really loosely to refer to really any water accounting. But in fact, it has a very specific definition, and we're going to hear more about that from uh, Guoping Zhang shortly. So I'll just be providing a broad um, definition of water footprinting. When people hear the term water footprinting, and here in the States it's not as um, well understood as it is perhaps in some places like Europe, it came out of the Netherlands, um, but usually we think of carbon footprinting because we're familiar with that term and we think that it's kind of the same. And they have in common the, the number, there's a number associated with a carbon footprint and a number associated with a, a water footprint, but that's really where the similarities end. Um, carbon, of course, um, contributes to a global problem, and if you reduce your carbon footprint, you can improve um, the problem globally uh, with, um, with, with um, uh, a climate ch associated with climate change, but a water footprint is, is local. And the impacts have to be evaluated at the local level. Um, if you use water, uh, consume water, it will have an impact on, the, on the, the humans and the aquatic life in that watershed where you took the water. Water is also uh, very complex. It, um, if you think about um, your earliest memories of water, um, maybe you, it, you think of war, a warm bath with a sibling or running through the sprinkler on a hot summer day. Um, I grew up on Lake Michigan, swimming in Lake Michigan. Um, really emotional and, and um, we connect with water. And water has spiritual and cultural significance around the world. Um, it is the ultimate shared resource. And I think Patricia really illustrated that in, in her presentation. Um, so uh, think for a moment about your early memories of carbon. It's not there. And so water is very different from carbon um, in, in many, many ways. And so I wanted to put that out there because uh, these initiatives really reflect that. They come from a wide range of concerns, from uh, safe drinking water um, and equitable use of water to impacts on aquatic species. I'm sure you've all seen uh, figures like this. I like this one. It, um, it takes all the water on our blue planet and shows how uh, uh, only um, a very small portion of it is fresh water. Most of that is tied up in glaciers and groundwater and not readily accessible. Uh, and then when you get down to what's really available, you're down to way less than 1% of, 
of available water. And of course, that water isn't um, distributed around the, the earth evenly, which is, uh, which is part of the problem. There are many maps that show uh, water stress globally. This one is comparing 1995 to 2025, and it's, um, in this case, water stress is measured as the water, water withdrawals as a percentage of the total available water. So uh, red uh, areas are, are more than 40% of the water is being withdrawn. Uh, this is withdrawals, not consumption. Um, and so you can see uh, that between 1995 and what's predicted for 2025, some areas of the world, some regions of the world are, are predicted to become a lot, more, uh, a lot more stressed, including the United States and, and Canada. Um, over the short term, over the next decade, the, the trends are, um, are concerning uh, in many different ways. Um, we have uh, population growth, an increase of approximately 1.5 billion people by 2020, um, and climate change on top of that. And, global development, not just population growth, but there's a dramatic increase in the, in the number of developed economies, and, and that has pressure on resources. So the effects of these on water are a significant increase in the competition for water, increased prices, increased conflict, uh, more public sector response, and an increase in demand for um, investment in, in water infrastructure. And, um, this figure that I put up here is from a recent report by the 2030 Water Resources Group. Charting Our Water Future uh, is the name of the report, and this study looks at the availability of water, the gap between existing supply and projected demand by the year 2030. And in China, um, Ch China was one of the countries that they took a close look at in terms of um, uh, particular uh, river basins. And you can see on this map the, the blue areas are predicted to, um, it's quite a range, 20 to 80 percent is shown as the the gap, and this is between existing supply and projected demand. And this study looks at levers and different ways that that gap can be filled in the future, um, everything from agriculture, mostly focused on, what, focused on the demand side and the supply side, and it's, it's an interesting report. Uh, health and water, um, one billion people approximately lack access to safe water, approximately 6,000 children die every day from waterborne diseases. And it isn't only a matter of availability. There are a large number of people who live where the water is plentiful, but they lack taps and toilets, and, um, uh, and, and health, health issues are, are complex. Those are what bring in organizations like USAID to the, to the water space. Um, there's a, a, a recognized significant decline in freshwater species. This is a chart showing for a number of countries, number of continents, um, from 1970 to 2000. Uh, the, the um, species populations, and you can see there's a downward trend. And we're losing some very charismatic species like freshwater dolphins um, in the Indus River and other rivers. So it's, um, this is what brings the NGOs like the Nature Conservancy and World Wildlife Fund into the, into the water space and into these initiatives. Um, there's an increased awareness uh, around the world of water problems, um, a recent survey uh, that you can see the details here of folks from around the world um, uh, found that more than 90% perceived water pollution and freshwater shortage as serious problems. And almost 80% uh, said that companies have a clear role and obligation to find solutions. And you can see there's along the bottom, I've just put some covers of magazines and it's quite um, prevalent in the media now to read about water issues. So there's definitely an increased awareness um, and businesses, as the survey indicated, businesses have a responsibility and an increasing recognition of their responsibility to um, address water management. Businesses are interested because of business risk. Uh, they face physical risk, meaning um, scarcity, poor water quality that impacts their supply. Uh, regulatory risk, meaning a, a change in the rules of the game. Uh, less availability, more, more, more regulations related to water, uh, and reputational risk that can result in loss of market share and loss of physical, um, social and physical license to operate in, in a country. All of these things contribute to financial risk, increased cost for the company, and reduced revenues. So of course investors are interested as well. So there's a need for metrics to encourage uh, sustainable practices. Um, both to understand the significance to all of these different uh, um, 
factors related to water and also to understand what can be done. What can companies do? What can governments do? Um, individuals? What, what can be done in terms of response to these problems? I've put up here almost um, two dozen uh, water stewardship initiatives that I'm aware of. I just became aware of uh, a, a new one yesterday. So it's been, it's hard to keep track of who's doing what. Some of these are bumping up against each other. Um, uh, people are, are coming from a lot of different perspectives and many of them are overlapping, but many are quite, uh, quite different. And I wanna just give you a, an overview of, um, of these. If you're interested, uh, I would recommend that you take a look at the World Business Council for Sustainable Developments report, Water for Business. It provides a nice overview of, and they, try, they update this regularly of these different initiatives. It's a useful resource. Uh, these, these different water stewardship initiatives have um, basically five elements, some or all of five elements. Water use accounting is, is prevalent in many of them, impacts assessment, uh, business risks, prevention and response, and public communication and disclosure. And none of them do it all. It depends on the perspective and, and the um, objectives of the developers. Some are oriented toward accounting methods that could enable comparisons. The water footprint network methodology, which we'll hear about a little bit more here today, um, as well as a parallel ISO water footprint uh, method and um, other work related to life cycle assessment. These are focused on, um, in part, on accounting methodologies for, for water use. Uh, the water footprint network uh, out of the Netherlands builds on the concept of virtual water. That water um, is embedded in a product. It carries a certain amount of water around that it took to produce that product. A water footprint builds on that, by, um, but it, it's specific to the time and the place of the use. So, um, and it sums it throughout the, the production chain, all the way from the field, in, in the case of agriculturally derived products, to the uh, end product. It's measured in terms of the water volumes consumed and or polluted. And it, it includes, as I said, where and when the water was used. It has three colors, uh, green, blue, and gray. Um, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on this because you'll hear more in a few minutes. But green is water that falls, it, agriculture, it's specific to agriculture, water that's consumed in the production of crops. Blue water, in the case of crops, would be irrigation water or water brought into a plant for industry. And then the gray water footprint is, is addressing pollution. Uh, the volume of fresh water required to assimilate the pollutant load. Um, but I'm sure that Guoping will, will share with you that uh, water footprinting, a water footprinting, a water footprint is one thing, it's an accounting, but the water footprint assessment includes not only water footprint accounting, but a sustainability assessment, uh, how sustainable is the use, and are there impacts, and then the response formulation, what are you gonna do about it, what are, what are your options? The water footprint accounting is, is more mature than the sustainability assessment and response uh, formulation, but those aspects of an assessment are moving uh, rapidly, moving forward rapidly. Uh, there is a, uh, an effort, um, an ISO uh, water footprinting. It's running parallel uh, to the water footprint network work, um, bumping up against it in some ways. Um, it's, uh, it's, under development, so I don't know <clears throat> a lot about it right now, but it will involve weighting factors to produce a score and so that it can be used in the context of LCA, life cycle analysis. Some, some of these initiatives are oriented toward helping businesses manage risks related to water. Um, I've listed some here. The global uh, GEMI um, is a business, pretty much inside a business, uh, how uh, you can evaluate your water use and the risks. The global reporting initiative uh, is, is an initiative that's um, uh, used in sustainability reports to provide a consistent way for businesses to report on their water use. And it includes these kinds of things that I've listed here so that you always can, everyone can report in the same way and have that, um, you know what they're talking about when you, when you read it. The Global Water Tool is another one of these uh, business-oriented tools developed by the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. It helps businesses assess risk from water scarcity. So basically you can plot your operations, both your direct operations, but also suppliers. And it, it's an Excel workbook and mapping tool and it allows you to understand where you're facing potential risk 
globally. Uh, and of course, you know, we all, we all use products that come, we live in a global economy, so it's, it's allowing you to understand how use in one place may be causing impacts in another place. Um, it's, uh, it'll, it, this is an example output. You can see basically what it's doing is, um, in this, for this output, uh, it's telling you that there are three uh, locations that are in areas of extreme scarcity. And um, one in area of scarcity. It allows you to, to, especially companies can have enormous supply chains, very complex supply chains, and it allows you to focus in on areas where kind of the red flag goes up and says, look a little closer. Some of these initiatives are oriented towards certification of products or businesses. Uh, the Alliance for Water Stewardship is, is one of these. That is um, a very interesting um, effort on, uh, involving uh, many stakeholders, World Wildlife Fund, um, uh, as an example, the Nature Conservancy, um, uh, Pacific Institute. These are, um, this is moving, this particular initiative um, is expecting to come out, I think, in the late fall with a draft standard. But their objective is to develop a global water stewardship program that will include an international water stewardship standard. So this is a multi-stakeholder driven, um, NGO driven effort. And this certifi certification scheme will be directed toward industry. So I like to think of it as like when you go to Home Depot um, or someplace in China like Home Depot and buy wood and it has a label on it. It says uh, this, is, this wood was grown using sustainable practices in the same way you would know if you were um, a company and you were looking at a range of suppliers, you would know that they use sustainable practices to produce that, um, that product that you're purchasing. So you don't have to do the research yourself. And it's, um, it's, it's more holistic than a lot of these um, other initiatives. I think shows a lot of promise. Uh, some of these initiatives are, are very focused on particular industries. I've listed a few here. The first is uh, beverage industry, their minerals industry, many, many, many different things going on out there. Um, some uh, are focused on um, uh, uh, the investment community. Investors want to know, and this is a really growing concern, if I invest in that company, are they going to be resilient to, to enough to handle climate change issues with water? Are they looking forward or are they just considering today? Um, and so uh, one of the initiatives that's come out of this is the Carbon Disclosure Project water disclosure. So it's similar to carbon disclosure project which had to do with reporting